It's Bigfoot Collectors Club with Bryce and Michael. <laughs> I know a ghost story or two. Let's do this. <laughs> the way you glared at me when I said, is it like a lion's roar? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Bigfoot Collectors Club. I believe this is episode 43. Mm. Uh, and I'm your host, uh, Michael McMillan. With me always is your other host. Bryce Johnson. And our trusty producer. Riley Bray. And I think it's actually episode 53. No, it's not, sir. We have Are not been sure doing this for a year. Yeah, but we've, we've doubled down episodes. Well, yes, but... It's episode 43 because we count some of the other episodes, like our listener files aren't numbered as, they're numbered as L files. Oh, okay. So you're both All right. right. So we're both right. All Probably right. there are around 53 episodes. I think but there's like 220. I think there's like 760. <laughs> We're Bigfoot Collectors Club from the future, yeah. time traveling you know back. You do, you do get an appreciation for those people who have like 400 episodes of their podcast. Oh, You're man. like, my God. Oh, yeah. I know. I was thinking about that the other day. I actually had the thought the other day. I was like, what have we done? My God, what have we done? Like, we've started <laughs> something that we will never end. Mm. I was like, <laughs> Can't week stop now. after week after week. <laughs> my wife might have a say about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, she has no say. We've been upset, possessed by the BCC oh podcast monster. Um, wow. So we uh, have an amazing guest who uh, this week who's not in studio, but we just had a really great conversation with her uh Author Linda S. Godfrey is on the show today, and yes. oh boy, you know, if you've been listening to the show, you've been hearing me raving about her work before. Um, she wrote the book Monsters Among Us and uh, uh, American Monsters. She's, a, she's the reporter who broke the story on the Beast of Bray Road. If you haven't listened to that episode, go check that out. That was from, uh, I think, last February or, or March with uh, Kristen um, Bauer was in that episode. Our first <laughs> official uh, cryptid investigator. Dude, we uh, we're now a real uh, paranormal podcast. Yeah. We're a, a official. We've yeah. got a real expert yeah. on the show today. Yeah. And uh, I mean, and also our first remote interview, which yeah, was very yeah, exciting. we're growing, yeah, we're yeah. growing, nice. guys. We're becoming. We still don't have t-shirts, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, we, will we will very soon. They're coming. Very, They're very coming. soon. They're we're coming. working on it right now. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, how fun was that? I mean, that we'll, was awesome. we'll, we'll obviously cut to the interview in just a moment, but and it was our first Skype interview, so there was a few little uh, scratches and screeches, beep, but boop, don't boop, don't boop. mind those. We we, uh, we, we, we plow right through. Chewbacca, them. iron them out pretty quickly here <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry about that uh, and it, really, I'm buffering. <laughs> it was a great conversation just to be able to sit down it's always great to be able to sit down uh not that we don't love our actors and celebrities mm -hmm. and musicians and writers who have great uh personal paranormal uh histories of their own but to be able to sit down and talk to an expert and really be able to like speak the, ling <laughs> the lingo talk dog man shop <laughs> yeah, is so delicious it is um i mean I I had a million questions going through my head. I'm gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna circle around back to that. Oh, I yeah. can't. Uh, of course, we couldn't get to everything, but we have a good chunky interview with Linda S. Godfrey. Um, so why don't we play that for you now, and then we'll come back and guess what? We still have some high strangeness for you this week yeah. uh, that Bryce has brought in. So can't wait. Enjoy our talk with Linda S. Godfrey, and we'll meet you back here after the break. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right, so our guest today is Linda S. Godfrey. She's an author, journalist, cartoonist, and one of the leading cryptid investigators working in the field today. Her books include The Beast of Bray Road, Real Wolf Men, True Encounters in Modern America, American Monsters, and Monsters Among Us, as well as a fantasy novel called God Johnson, The Unforgiven Diary. Linda, uh, it is such an honor to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Yes. Thanks for having me. Uh, so before we started rolling, we were talking about the weather changing here in Los Angeles as it's now October, uh, that spooky month that we all love, yeah. and uh, the dangers of falling palm trees or palm leaves. 
Uh, and you were talking to us just off the cuff about a Sasquatch ripping a branch off a giant oak tree. Is is that true? It is. It is. It was a, a crazy time. It was um, in August 2012. I really had not been having much luck over the past uh, before that 20 some years since it's how uh, that's how long I've been at this and had really not seen much at all in the field other than footprints and that sort of thing. And I was just out for a walk. I lived at the time on the edge of a forest, a, a state forest called the Kettle Moraine, which has deep gorges and, and high ridges in between, and people don't go in it much. But I was walking along a trail just on a whim, a Sunday afternoon. Nobody was around. It was completely quiet. And I just took it into my head to try. Uh, I had never tried this before, and I was all alone. I thought, what the heck? I picked up a branch, and I tried hitting a tree with it, you know, like the Bigfoot hunters do. Right. And I tried it a couple of times, and lo and behold, I got a knock back. And the knock was from very, very close to me. And it was in an oak tree, a big old oak tree that was growing up out of one of these kettles or uh, little gorges so that it was partly down in there and partly up over it. And I was almost at eye level because it was growing from down below. Right. With, with what I could see the leaves shaking. And I thought, well, that can't have just happened, you know. So I tried it again, and I got another knockback. And, I mean, it was real, It was so close that if it had been a human, and there, there weren't any people around at all, and people don't go down into those kettles normally because they're full of brush and tangles and ticks you know, and, and that kind of thing. So um, I was starting to get a glimmer of, of what this might be that was doing it, but I still, I couldn't believe it. You know, I was just standing there in shock and disbelief. Plus I was all by myself. Right. With no, I didn't <laughs> that was, that was my next right? thought. Just you yeah. and your 357 Magnum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I left at home that day. <laughs> but um, no, I, but I, I had to know because there were only two things that could grasp a branch. You know, you have to have an opposable thumb to hold mm -hmm. something, an eight foot, or excuse me, eight. it was eight inches thick and 35 feet long, this branch. I measured it later. And I, but it was huge. And the tree was so full of foliage. It was completely green. You know, there were no dead leaves on it. I knew it was living, whatever it was, or whatever, or whatever was doing this. Mm -hmm. And... I, I hit it again, and this time, instead of, of uh, hitting the tree again, there was this huge crack sound, like when you hear it. Uh, well, maybe you don't hear this in L.A. very much, but, you know, when we have an ice storm and, and the branches get too heavy, they just they crack and, and yeah. fall. Yeah, I grew up in Kansas, so I know that sound. Hey, yep, yeah, so you know that. One. Yeah, so that's there was this, this tearing, cracking sound, and, again, in total disbelief, I— you know, it, it, it was so surreal. It's hard to describe. It's like you, you think you're in a dream, but you know you're not, or you're yeah. hoping you're in a dream. So I did it one more time, and that time the answer was to rip the rest of the branch completely from the tree, and whatever was doing it was hidden behind the leaves that there were so many of on that tree, and it threw it like 40 feet down to the bottom of that kettle. Whoa. Wow. And at that point, I... I knew what it was. There was absolutely nothing else. Although I had a few questions in my mind as I'm running home as fast as I can. Uh, yeah. So I, you just, <laughs> you, did you, you didn't hesitate. You just ran as soon as that tree branch flew. I mean, were you, did you, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I did because I know, you know I just, I just knew in my mind that it couldn't have been a human. It was just too big and too heavy. And then I thought, well, what if woodpeckers had gotten at it? You know, right. although woodpeckers usually go after dead trees. And this one, I could see the white, nice wood where it was splitting away from the tree trunk. Mm -hmm. You know, so I knew that it was not a rotten old tree. But I thought, well, maybe what if some deranged human had gone, slogged through that um, little crevasse to get up in that tree and saw off part of the branch and then... <laughs> But why? Yeah. Why? Why would anyone do that? That doesn't well, yeah, make sense. That, yeah. You know, your mind is just stretching for anything other than what I knew it to be. I guess so, you could have a uh, neighbor. You could have had a neighbor that knew you were a cryptid investigator and wanted to torment you. But like, absolutely. why would anyone what do this? What an elaborate hoax. And how would they have known when I was going to go for that walk? Exactly. You know, like I said, I, it was just spur of the moment. You know, my family had gone somewhere and I was 
just wanting to wanting to get a little exercise. But again, just ran out the door. I thought I'll I'll do maybe a mile and come back, you know. So I had a friend who's um, a, a trained field um, investigator too, who lived about five minutes away from me. I called her. She and her twenty year old daughter were right over, and we I can't believe we did this, but we went down into that kettle because I just had to see it. There and there were no woodpecker marks, no saw marks, nothing like that. Um, we did find where something on the branch in two places had rubbed away um, these mitten-like shapes, but they were like twice the size of a human hand. I still have. And then I found the bark. It, something had crushed the the tree and the bark so hard that this shape of the bark just fell right off of the tree, and I still have that. And it stunk like s- sweet grass and skunk, just slightly. Whoa. Looks yeah, like it, something wanted to make your books. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Well, it got wor- it, I mean, it got more than that. Um, her daughter was just kind of wandering around aimlessly on the, the ridge, sort of bored. And all of a sudden, we heard her scream. And by the time we got up there, and looked, she had seen it. She had seen a Bigfoot. Um, and it was a, a, an unusual color. Most people don't know that they can be this color. They're called blonde Bigfoots, but they're... Um, we get them out here in California. Oh, uh, yeah, Yucca like Man is a blonde out yeah, in the Mojave. Yeah. Yeah, like a beige and gray mix, sort of. Mm-hmm. And she didn't know that they could be that. And she saw it running behind um, a big bunch of greenery. And she said she she was kind of in shock and, you know, described it as being huge and the right size. And, and she said it was she said it, it was moving fast, but it wasn't exactly walking or running. I'd say it was striding, which is a perfect way to describe, you know, how they just sneak from one place to another. And then we were standing there and... Um, it growled at us from behind that. Whoa. And it was this deep, just low, huge, noisy growl that you knew whatever was making that had a set of lungs on it. Right. Oh, you my know? gosh. Right. So you're hearing this, that 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 growl, when you say, like, deep, deep, guttural, deep guttural large lungs, is it, would you... Was it something akin to like a lion, or was it more more like a Bigfoot? Michael? More like a Bigfoot? <laughs> no, but you know, like well, you know, lions or, or great cats have that kind of. It's almost a purring growl, right? When, when, they, when they growl, it's this almost smooth purring sound to it, and um, you know, it was closer maybe to like a big dog's growl, but not really. It was still different than that. It's hard. It was just so so um, deep down into the sound spectrum. That it was hard to believe, you know, anything could be making that noise. But the hair just literally stood up on the backs of our necks, and I just said, "Ladies, I I think we need to leave now." <laughs> and, yeah. and, we, and we did. Now, if you want to see some photos of this, if you go to lindagodfrey.com, that's my blog, and there's a search box. Just type in Bigfoot Branch. Okay. There's a picture of that branch and of the mitten-shaped um, bark that was taken off of it. We're gonna check but, it out right now. Yeah, and, and that was my inaugural um, experience with really seeing these creatures out there. I mean, and this wasn't your like first time experience with cryptids. You had been writing, you know, years prior to all this. Well, and I'd been doing field work since the very beginning. You know, one of right. the first things that happened was this other paper uh, wanted me to take a, a supermarket chicken, supermarket chicken, and put it out in the ditch at Bray Road, where people had been seeing this upright. Uh, wolf-like creature. Oh yeah, I want to get into uh, wow. into all that. Uh, real quick before we move on, did you ever experience anything with the um, with that particular Bigfoot again? Any evidence of him uh, in those woods again? I never saw that blonde one myself. I mm-hmm. think it was just passing through or something. And where it had been, that tree. Oh, back I see to- this. Yeah, we're looking at the photo right now. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Whoa. <laughs> Still scares me when I see it. Um, the tree was right on a super well-used deer trail where I'd seen some really large deer. I, I think maybe it was like a community um, deer for supper spot or something. But I did see three separate viewings in 2014 in different seasons of the year um, doing slightly different things of a smaller um, black furred one with a round head. It didn't have the, the crest. you know. Oh, a, really? But I did see I did see it three times in daylight each time, and not all that far away. Not as close as I was to the branch, but but really close enough to you know to tell what it was. How uh, when you say small, how what how many feet are we talking? <laughs> Five, six feet? 
I would say this one was probably around six feet, maybe. Okay. It was hard. It was hard to tell exactly. And do you think it was a juvenile, or do you think it was just the adult species of that um, type is is not as tall as some of the other crested crested ones? Um, I think it could be both, you know, or or either. It's hard to say. I did, I did think that it was a juvenile because I had before that a couple of years previous found what looked like some juvenile footprints in that vicinity. And they just, they weren't castable because they were on a sloped ground. Mm. But, um, there had, there was another one that was taller and, uh, probably more like seven, eight feet and was a dark brown color that had fur that was in the same area. And I should preface all this by saying the Southern unit of the Kettle Moraine state forest has had sightings since the 1960s. Okay. And I've, do- I've documented a lot of them. So it's not like I was in, it was me in particular. It's just that I happened to be living right next to a really lively um, area for Bigfoot. And and once once I think most people live in those places. And if you're not thinking about them, if you're not tuned in, you would hear something and you would just put it off to another um, source and, and not think about it. Or you're not looking to the sides when you're driving. You're just looking like you should be straight ahead of the road. Right. Wow. Linda, but, let me double back on that real quick. You said sure. it wasn't me in particular. Do you ever do you ever get the feeling or the sensation that uh, maybe there is something to uh, you in a, as an observer that might have attracted or, um, you know, uh, this type of sighting or anything like that? Do you ever feel like that, uh, that, that, that we can play a part into that or was this just sort of a a random happenstance you just had to be at the right place at the right time um i I think it might have been a little bit of both although what i think is that they're very tuned in to humans who are in whatever vicinity they're in because that's you know their, their lives sort of depend upon that and there was a real interesting study a few years ago with crows which are extremely intelligent birds and it was proven that crows could follow certain humans and identify them when they came outside, especially if a human had had some, you know, treat or bread or something and put it down. Yeah, they they remember faces. Exactly. They would know who those humans were. Well, if a crow can do that, certainly a giant humanoid could do it. And I think what they would do would be to watch any humans that are in that vicinity. And then most of the time, like I kind of said earlier, humans are just let me get where I'm going, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, what I'm doing next, I'm going to the office, but, and they're not looking around or watching what's next to them. And when mm-hmm. they see somebody who's walking, looking carefully, stopping at one of their footprints, looking around, looking up in the trees, um, they go, uh-oh, yeah, <laughs> we got a live one here, wow. you know, and, and from then on, they might be more aware of you when you're there, you know, and, and perhaps they've gotten to that point. I wish and, you could see the smile on Bryce's face right now, Linda. This is like <laughs> his dream come true hearing this story. You know, I'm I'm very curious about your friend's uh, 20-year-old daughter. Like, was, is she, was she, um, was she, where are you the, going with this, Oh, Bryce? just give me a minute here. Is she, was she, is she into this type of stuff or was she a, a skeptic or was she just there to help her mom out or uh, how did that change or affect uh, what she saw and what she believed? Well, she was totally neutral. I mean, she really didn't know much about it, hadn't thought about it. And like you said, she was mostly there to help her mom out. You know, wow. just, to, um, you know, Sandra said, um, Sandra Schwab is, is her name. And she said, well, you know, Natalie, there's something there. And why don't you come along? I think I think Sandra was a little nervous, too, because she could tell from my voice. And it's always a good idea to have three rather than two in my book when you're mm-hmm. doing <laughs> Thing like that, so at least totally. one of them could run for help. Yeah, you know? Linda. Do you, would... Sorry to. Do you do you think that one of these creatures would attack a human? Would hurt? hurt would have hurt you guys? Um, I think if we had persisted and gotten aggressive acting, or um, had seemed like we were going to threaten it in some way, there's always that potentiality, mm. you know. And I I tell people. Because people say, well, what do I do if I see one? You know, should I run up to it, shake its hand? Should I run the other way? You know, and I said, well, what you, what I think is that since they appear to be some sort of animal, well, in the case of Bigfoot, I really think they're a type of human. Mm, that was but, my next question. Yeah, but um, the thing is, since we don't know for sure, because, you know, nobody to anyone's satisfaction has had been able to hold one up and you know examine it and take his blood test and all that kind of thing we don't know so what i recommend is treating them with the same respect you would show to any sort of predator that's big enough to eat you yeah 
I always felt yeah. like, uh, you know, within the Bigfoot social order, there might have been some rules passed down from the uh, from the Bigfoot elders. Like, now you can throw rocks at them. You can, <laughs> uh, you know, you can respond to their tree knocking, but. Uh, and you and can even a kidnap the occasional one or two. But, <laughs> Throw one in their <laughs> sleeping bag. Throw one in your sleeping bag, but we're not allowed to hurt them or bite them. Or, uh, Bryce it, likes to, to prescribe to the gentle giant yeah. uh, aspect of Bigfoot. I think they could probably get pretty nasty if they want to. Mm, interesting. Oh, yeah, I do, too. You know, it's the same with the dog man type of thing. It's just that there may there may have been fatal accidents and people never lived to tell the story yeah you know, yeah otherwise they they both really otherwise seem mostly territorial like they're just trying to get you the heck out of their um feeding grounds or their birthing places or whatever else they have to shield from the nosy humans well if you believe uh teddy roosevelt's story about his friend the explorer yeah, the uh, bauman. bauman and his encounter with some type of entity entity in the woods that, that According to him, uh, one of these uh, creatures killed his uh, his uh, prospecting partner in that mm. story. Right. So, and I mean, that, he was like crushed to death. Now, it this was before the, the term Bigfoot was coined. He referred to him as a as a hairy boogeyman yeah, of sorts, a goblin. But they, a goblin, right? That walked on two mm. legs. But nonetheless, he tore his friend apart. <laughs> <laughs> so creepy. Yeah, yeah. and well, dogs do not hesitate for dogs or anything that really is. Threatening to them. I mean, they're they're not different than us. They're not going to lie down and be shot or killed or whatever we want to do to them just so we can examine their bodies. Mm. Right, right. So, listen, uh, we can't talk to you without talking about dogmen. You already brought them up. And I don't even know where to begin because I love dogs, but I thought that this phenomenon was, honestly, I thought it was a joke until I read your book, Monsters Among Us, and I read your research on the Beast of Bray Road, and now Dogmen, for me, have jumped to the top of my favorite cryptid. <laughs> your cryptid <laughs> yeah. food chain. <laughs> like, I love these stories. They are so compelling. They are so fascinating. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what drew you into the Beast of Bray Road story to begin with. We have a question that we like to ask our guests, which we've already gotten into, which is, what is your personal paranormal history? And you could probably speak for days <laughs> about about that. But uh, can you take us back a little bit to the beginning of where you were when the Beast of Bray Road happened and uh, how you started researching this, this phenomenon? Well, it was never my intention at all. I mean, it yeah. is. I don't just, think most people wake up, except for us now that we're doing a podcast. I think most people don't wake up and go, "Dog men, let's do, let's go for that." No, but even even you and I were propelled into this sort of uh, these true. sort of things, you know. It's true. So, Linda, go on, please. Well, um, I actually was trying to be a nationally syndicated cartoonist. I, by the way, I really enjoy your artwork. Uh, everyone should go to Linda's uh, website and check out her stuff, and her illustrations are in her books as well. Thank you. And that's lindagodfrey.com with no W's, by there the way. There you go. Yep. But anyway, um, I, it, this was back in the late um, 19, well, er, early 1990s, like 1989, 1991. And I had worked, I, I had been working and working to do either um, a nationally syndicated comic strip, which is really hard to do. And I had gotten so close um, and then had a big disappointment. And I was also doing editorial cartoons back in the day when I st was still able to be opinionated in one direction or the other. Right. Today, I'm, I'm too, I'm too uh, able to see both sides of something. You know, it makes it really hard to be an editorial cartoon. That's a good thing. But back then, um, I actually, I, I think it is. You know, it's easier to live that way. But um, and I did have, um, I was able to join the National Cartoonist Society, and I had. Um, Cartoons in the 1991, 92, and 93 best um, editorial cartoons. Oh, that's books. so cool! Telecom Press, yeah. So, I mean, I, it's not like I was totally dreaming about it, but uh, it was very hard if you didn't live in a big city to get any kind of a job doing that, and harder if you were a woman. I think there were two other women in that cartoonist society, oh, yeah. um, and I was a member. So, anyway, I had gone and just volunteered my services for free to this to our county newspaper. And uh, was they, they literally started paying me eight dollars a cartoon. <laughs> it was not the Depression era. It was, <laughs> it was Time to quit the job. Oh, man. Exactly. But I did it just to get some things printed, you know, and have something to show. 
You're, you're, you're talking to uh, actors, working actors in Los Angeles. So we know. <laughs> We know the oh, feeling. We know, we know all about eight bucks. <laughs> yeah, and a musician. And a musician. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and a musician. There you go. Yeah, about the same level. Musicians, artists, and journalists. All yeah. They, they <laughs> about the same. But anyway, I had um, I was talking to the editor, and it just so happened that their uh, main reporter had quit. And uh, I think he sort of jokingly said, oh, so you want to be a reporter? And I thought, well, this is an opportunity. How hard could that be? You know, maybe I'd, if I were around there more, I'd get to do more artwork and cartoons. Mm -hmm. And so I accepted. And the first thing that came up was people around my hometown of Elkhorn were saying something that looked like a werewolf was showing up on this country road outside of Elkhorn. And um, several people had seen it. And when I looked into it, I found other people. They seemed um, very, um, oh, just like normal, regular people. They didn't seem like they were lying or trying to make a hoax. And we ran the story, and it went national without the Internet, I might add. Right. Within a couple of weeks, we had uh, the new Sci-Fi's New In Search Of came out at the time. Oh, wow. And um, Had you given any thought previously to uh, things of this nature? Well, not of things that looked like werewolves, because, you know, I just figured they were sort of um, some unknown part of uh, some unknown thing from from long ago if they ever existed at all I didn't believe in the Hollywood ones you know I I really was interested in Bigfoot um, you know I'd been keeping up with those books and uh, and, and other things in the paranormal uh, just as part of my um, religious studies I considered them mm -hmm. so so I had kind of a mind toward that way but I did not think, and I still don't think, that these upright canines with wolf-like features were werewolves. That you know, humans turning into wolves right. and the full moon and all that. That's, that's mostly. What, that's Hollywood. what I think of when I think of a werewolf. Is it somebody? Yeah. It's a human that transforms. Full into, moon, silver bullet. Yeah. So right. what, how how do you categorize the? You call them upright canines, um, dogmen. How 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 do you categorize them? And what is their relationship to something like Bigfoot? Good question. Yeah, um, well, it's hard. It's really hard to categorize them because, again, we don't know exactly what they are, and most of the sightings are just, you know, it, it runs along the road, it might bump up against your car, it might just run in front of the car, it might be eating something, but it's not doing anything magical because um, just being a biped, walking on your hind legs, is not a supernatural act. Almost right. any animal can do it. Um, it's just that four-legged uh, quadrupeds are not meant to bear all their weight on their hind legs, and it's uncomfortable. They don't normally do it unless they're hurt or, um, you know, have a, a disease or something. So it's unusual for us to see them doing this in the wild. And so I was really leaning more toward the idea for a long time that it was probably some kind of natural wolf um, or maybe a large uh, koi, koi, koi dog or koi wolf, some kind of hybrid that had been injured or something, and was walking upright because it gave it some sort of advantage, you know, like it could see over the top of the corn or, mm -hmm, you know, what it, mm -hmm, it was. Mm -hmm. But then over time, um, it, I mean, it's been now like 26 years since that happened, going on 27. And I realized that um, we had lo gone long past uh, the lifespan of any normal wolf. I think a, a normal wolf's lifespan in the wild is something like eight, nine years. And that's a pretty good one. Um, and that also, back you know when this was first published in the newspaper and it went national, everybody from around the world who had seen one started writing me about it. And I, I had realized it was not just this one little road and this one little creature. There were creatures that looked and sounded exactly like this one all over North and South America, Europe, um, other places. And it was a worldwide phenomenon that was just not recognized as being as universal as it is. It only takes one person to really start to come out and talk about this stuff, right? I mean, I sometimes I feel like these witnesses are just waiting for another person to sound a little bit crazier than them. You know what I mean? That's, to to, to feel comfortable true. talking about it. Sure. That's true. And people are still, I mean, I still to this day will get messages from people saying, I saw this thing 20 years ago. I never knew what it was. I thought I was crazy. Then I saw you on TV. So... I'm writing to you and, and uh, hoping you can tell me what it is. Well, I, I, I still don't claim to be able to do that, but, you know, there just are so many associations. And there are other 
things that look like upright canines right. that that seem to have more of a paranormal cast to them or right. you know you get into like the native american skinwalker things or um others that may be um may have to do with with certain rights or psychological abilities that kind of thing um one of the things i found remarkable when reading uh i believe it was in monsters among us and you were talking about or maybe it was when i was reading your work on uh research on the beast of bray road uh, one of the things that jumped out at me was how many eyewitnesses described these um, creatures as having shoulders that are more like a human's than a dog's. Is that correct? Like they, it has more of a um, a human shaped torso than something that would be like a wolf walking around on 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 its hind legs. You know, a dog has very right. different shaped arms and shoulders than we do. Right. Yeah. They basically don't have shoulders. Right. Which is why when somebody does describe that at first, it really surprised me. But I when I started thinking about it, um, you can rationalize it as that many, many people, when they see these things running around, they'll be carrying like a quarter of a deer. Mm -hmm. or, you know, they're, they've got something over their sh a dead dog over their shoulder or, or something like that. And if you think about it, those uh, four limbs are being used for activities that the um, creature normally wouldn't use them for. Normally, they're just um, being used to run on. But now they're being asked to, you know, hold these things and do, you know, do all sorts of other stuff. So naturally, they would get more muscle um, mm. in areas where they normally wouldn't have that amount of muscle built up. Now, you said you said uh, carrying a quarter of a deer, and then you said, or a dead dog. Is there? And then you kind of laughed, Linda. Is there, is there and a I lot got of, a little nervous. Is there, is there a <laughs> lot of... <laughs> are there witness accounts of, uh, of, of dog men sort of uh, hunting or preying upon other uh, canines or, or, or uh, domesticated dogs? Yeah, I've gotten reports. And the only reason I kind of chuckled is because I'm aware of how crazy it sounds. No, of you know? course. Yeah, we, we tease. I'm, I'm, always, I'm always aware of, <laughs> of what it sounds like, but it, this is just what pe I just report on what people see. And um, I had one fellow who had seen his dog run barking into the woods, and by the time he found him, the dog was pretty much in shreds. And, oh, bummer. Um, he had seen like a dog, met, and it's kind of hmm. like they and the Bigfoot don't like to have dogs up close to them in most cases if the dogs are yapping and giving away their um, position in the woods or who knows going after their young ones yeah. um, but and and cats also seem to be um, on the menu as well keep they, your cats not... inside everybody well you know that goes back to what I was saying earlier it's like those same rules that seem to uh, apply to humans don't apply to animals like cattle and and uh, dogs and cats and and stuff like that you see a lot more cases of uh, of you know of, of these animal type mutilations. of animal mutilations, absolutely, and, and, and they're out there for everybody to see, you know, as opposed to just some missing person gone with no trace or no evidence, you know. Right, Linda. Didn't uh, correct me if I'm wrong. In one of the original eyewitness accounts of the Beast of Bray Road, didn't one of the um, drivers who saw the beast on the side of the road in a ditch wasn't he carrying like some fish in his hands or some type of food, some type of animal? Um, I'm not recalling one with fish. Maybe it was um, mistaking that part of it, but um, but there, I mean there have been um, people who have seen a couple of times when people have seen them sort of kneeling in a way that canines wouldn't normally kneel and holding like a piece of dead roadkill or something in their upturned palms. Right, which that's what I'm thinking of. Or or drinking at kneeling and drinking at a river and bringing cupping their paws together and bringing the the water up to their uh, jaws, you know, rather than putting their head down in and lapping like you would expect a canine to do. Right. That is such a spooky image. Just a, a, do a dog man drinking out of his own palms. I don't know why that's so scary to me. <laughs> but it's Because it's a very human gesture. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, maybe a primate, you know, maybe gorillas do that. Um, I don't know. Or chimps. But what else would? It, I mean, if I were to come home and find my two dogs, I have a terrier and an English bulldog walking around on their hind legs. That would be the <laughs> scariest thing I think I've ever seen in my life. Um, so what what is the um, 
what's the Michigan dog man? Uh, what, what's what's kind of the uh, one liner on that? Because um, I was trying to do some research on it, and I've I, I came across some stuff that said that it was actually the Michigan dog man was something that a radio host wrote a, a kind of a gag song about. But since then, or even before then, people were actually seeing an upright uh, canine in Michigan. Um, yeah, it's that's pretty close to it, actually. The uh, thing that was in Michigan, though, sounds pretty much exactly like the things that are in Wisconsin on Bray Road and almost everywhere else. 90% of the sightings are of this large, wolf-like, upright creature that can... And they can, I should add, they can drop down and run on all fours still, too. You know, they, they don't have to be on their um, hind legs. And a lot of witnesses will either see them trotting along on their hind legs and then they drop down to all four when they see they're being watched. Or they're on all fours and they stand up to menace and be aggressive toward whoever's looking at them. So mm. they can be seen both ways. But, but yeah, this was back in 1987 before the Beast of Bray Road. It just never went national or got really known much outside the state of Michigan. And this Traverse City DJ um, thought he would make a CD for um, to, to raise funds for an animal shelter. And he was kind of a musician, so he wrote this kind of ballad-like song and called the the dog man actually he called it the legend but it was about the dog man and which was kind of an old lumber camp um so-called myth from that state right and he said he took a few old lumber camp stories that he'd heard of and then there had been something interesting on the news that i think inspired him toward this end where there was a a house in luther they call it a cabin but i've been there it's a little two-story house with with siding um, on the outskirts of town where they had seen uh, scratches like seven feet up on the siding and there were large dog tracks all around on the ground below it. So that one he put in it and then he made some up. You know, he just made, when he ran out of things, he, he made, a, made a few of them up. And uh, then he played it on April Fool's Day in 1987 because it was supposed to come out on the seventh year of every decade. That okay. was the that was the deal. And when he played it, you know, he was kind of tongue in cheek and he was expecting people to be yucking it up. And instead, people were calling and saying, hey, that dog man is no joke. I saw him. <laughs> wow. My grandpa saw him or, you know, it's out there in the woods and it's real. And and he was rather taken aback. But then it just came out more and more. So when the Beast of Bray Road went national, he actually contacted me. And yeah, they had had like a, a dog man art contest and you know, we're really playing it up a lot more than than I ever did with, with the Beast because um, he kept it as sort of a, a money-raising thing for this right. in, in Traverse City. But it was mostly like the one that we had in, in the way people would describe it, what they had seen. So hmm. um, it's it's pretty universal. And then there are also the universal mag so-called magical types that are different, that have the shoulders... They'll usually have red eye shine instead of uh, the normal green yellow of, that canines have. Are those the ones that are described with having like almost German shepherd heads with the tall pointy ears like a German shepherd? Well, the German shepherd is uh, is one of the universal terms the and the tall pointy ears. But you do what these other ones often have. They're very often um, pitch black furred. And then besides on top of the pointy ears, they have tufts of hair. Or the ears are taller, like they'll say it looked like Anubis. Right. You know, mm -hmm. The Egyptian mm -hmm. god of the dead, where it looks like it has a, a black furred jackal head and then either a human body or um, a human like. Um, are they flesh and blood or are those supposed to be more like shadow creatures? Uh, I, I think those are probably not flesh and blood because they appear suddenly inside people's bedrooms and then walk right. back to the wall oh, and do other strange, creepy things. So wow. I, I think there's something other than the normal uh, wolf-looking ones that just walk on their hind legs and leer or sneer or or um, jeer at people, depending on which word they, they choose. That's how they describe it. So, I mean, yeah, yeah this is where it just gets interesting and, 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 and confusing for me because it's like, I mean, do we lump all these 
sort of creatures into the paranormal field because you know there's there's cases of bigfoots you know uh transversing through walls too and showing up in people's bedrooms right. and communicating psychically to them i mean right. are, are there are there different categorizations in your mind that like hey you know here's some flesh and blood bigfoot that uh you know that can't uh you know go through walls and then there's the type that can and then here's dogman that can't and here's dogman that can or do you think this is all part of some bigger paranormal phenomenon right you know and that is it's that's one of the biggest bugaboos and i mean you can drive yourself crazy thinking okay this one can do that that can't you know there must be 47 varieties and and there are um i mean i think i could point out you know at least five or six different um, sorts of them. I, I don't want to call them species because that right. would, have, you know, they're all animals. But I think that the Native American people I've talked to have the paradigm that best fits all of the reports, which is that it's not an either or. It's more like a sliding scale, mm -hmm. and it's that they originally come out of what they call the spirit world. We might call it another dimension, another realm, something like that, another universe. And that they can enter our world most of the time. They believe these um, passages or portals are in running water, um, bubbling creek springs, that kind of thing is, is the best place where they come from. Sure. They can come here. And when they're here, um, most of the time they're entirely corporeal. Their bodies function. You know, they eat, they um, digest, they, have, they procreate, do all these things. Yep. But... They can, at times, for different reasons we probably don't understand well yet, um, can be sort of partially in one world and partially in our world at the same time. And that's when you get these kind of spooky sightings. And that when they really want to, they can go back to that spirit world. Mm. That's and fascinating. It, it, it is fascinating because it's the only thing that really fits what everybody in Toto describes. Right. Well, and I say, and I, and, and, you know, to that, I could say you can flip the other side of the coin and there's experiences with humans where, you know, we live in this corporal corporeal world, but then at this time, um, you know, the veil gets lighter and then, you know, certain individuals seems to pass through to this other side as well, you know, um, and then come back. So it seems to be, yeah, it's, it's, I, I don't know how to explain it. It's just, it's all very strange. And I, I think what you were saying about those, you know, Native American legends, uh, they seem to have a real good grasp on it. Not only because, you know, they don't treat it as some sort of teenage taboo. This is right. something that's mythologized to them and it's, and it's real as much as it is as they would describe an eagle and, and, and its nest. You know, this isn't just right. part of their, you know, um, spiritual lore. This, you know, they take this stuff at face value and, they, and then they pass it down. So, um, yeah, that's wild. Yeah, it, and it's, well, you know, I think of it this way, too. I mean, when you get down to the real nitty-gritty of what we are, we're made of um, waves and particles, yeah. you know, and, and atoms, and which are affected by electromagnetic fields. Mm -hmm. and electromagne electromagnetic fields are not just, it's not, not just like one electromagnetic vibration. It's like light waves and like sound waves, which are on sliding scales. There are light waves which are too high in the spectrum for us to see and, and too low for us to see, but there's this middle sweet spot. And the same thing with sound waves. And I think that electromagnetic fields, which every living thing, we have them, the creatures have them, uh, you know, the earth has it, is perhaps also on a sliding scale. I would that, agree with that. Do you, do you yeah. think that our consciousness plays the part of the tuner in some sense of the word? Yes. Like yes. Our, our awareness of these things and our, our, our openness to them, and not only that, but our, our focusing in on, on these types yes. of phenomenon actually can sort of turn that dial for us. Yes. Yeah, in fact, I've experienced a couple of things that really make me think that. Um, one of these, again, I, I wrote about it in The Monsters Among Us, but more in detail, but... This happened a couple of years ago in a farm field right near Bray Road, which I'd been surveilling and experimenting in with the farmer who owns it for several years. And he and I and another colleague were out um, surveilling his 40-some uh, acre hay field one night because he'd, he'd been putting out um, dead deer that he collected legally. I won't, I won't go into all that, but um, for bait because he'd started having animal mutilations and was studying what would happen if he put, you know, all these different deer out. It was like deer number 18 over a couple of different years and nothing was touching it, nothing. And it should have just been eaten like almost immediately. 
Sure. It, I said, well, you know, maybe, maybe um, there's something bigger than the things that usually come and yeah. eat it. And, <laughs> and maybe we could see what it was if we just, you know, sat out and kind of watched the field because his trail cams weren't getting anything but weird lights, which they do. He's got thousands of pictures from his trail cams. So anyway, we're sitting out in this car with um, our friend and colleague, Sanjay, and the, the two guys, and they're both over like six foot two. We're in the, the front seat. I was in the back. I always like to make sure there's nothing sneaking up on us from behind. <laughs> Smart, so, good. And we're watching, we're wa- it's a nice August night. We're watching um, airplanes coming along this flight route that wasn't uh, too far away, and it was over the trees where he usually laid the, well, well, he had this deer carcass lying there, so we were facing that way. And all of a sudden, one of these so-called airplanes stopped it just stopped dead in the sky hmm. watching it make progress and then right before my eyes it backed up what? it wasn't like it wasn't like oscillating and i said um, guys i don't think that one's an airplane and i pointed and now this is what's important the three of us all suddenly gave it our attention mm-hmm. when we did that it began to travel in a straight beeline across that um field straight for us and not at a super fast rate, but I mean, it didn't take it all that long to get across the fields enough so that we were we were all gasping, going, "What? What is that? What? Wait, wait, that's coming this way!" It's, you know, we're we're making exclamations because we had no way to really interpret what this thing was or what it was going to do. And I'm fumbling with my camera, trying to get it in position so I can, because they're kind of blocking my view, <laughs> the way the car was pointing. And before we knew it, it was right at the car. And it was like maybe 30 feet in the air, maybe 25, 30 feet away from us, which isn't very far. What? And, uh, wow. And there's going. three of us. There's three of us. Who think, you know, it's not just like one scared person. And it was about the size of a basketball. We all agreed it was a perfect sphere. And it was dimly, well, not, I shouldn't say dimly, it was lit from within somehow, but mm. not like a paper lantern. It was, it was um, a lighted spherical object. So this, is, this sort of sounds like uh, one of the, you hear about the spook lights or Willow the Wisp. Yeah, very, very much so. It's given me a lot of new thoughts on that. So anyway, we're looking at it, and I'm just getting my camera up to focus it. And Sanjay just gets seized by this impulse to shine the flashlight on it. And they had a big mag light in the front seat. And his window was down, and he just shined, shined it on this thing. And we all had this amazing feeling that whatever it was was shocked and surprised that we shined this light on it uh-huh. and it it kind of we we still argue about how to describe it because it was something that's very hard to describe unless you see it, it was sort of jittering a little bit as maybe the closest but not really getting i don't know I, I fall apart when i try and describe it but anyway it it closed down its light it wasn't expecting that no it, and and it was shocked and then it closed down its light and we didn't know where it went or what it did or anything. And Sanjay said, well, I'm going to get out of the car and see if it went behind those bushes. And he, we're like, okay, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, if you want to volunteer for that, go, yeah, go, go on, Sanjay. Get yeah. out there, Sanjay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're behind you. So he did, and within less than a minute, he came kind of staggering back to the car. And he said, I'm sick. I'm really sick. We have to leave right now. Mm. And since he was driving, we did. And uh, Lee and I, who had remained in the car, felt fine. But we left at that point. And we, who knows? Maybe he saved us from getting abducted. I don't know what it would have done. Mm-hmm. Stayed. I have no idea. But the thing is, it was when we all put our consciousness upon it. Sure. And, and looked at it and were observing it, that that is when it made its move and made it its way across the field toward us. So well, so wild. We've isn't it? we've had uh, guests on this show actually um, talk about similar experiences. One involving a black triangle UFO that she and her mother, when she was a child, observed from a distance, and as soon as they were focusing on it, it zoomed towards them and hovered over them uh, before disappearing into the night sky. Right. What, yeah. what What do you make of that, Linda? That's I mean, it's amazing. I think that they somehow uh, sense our consciousness and interact with it, you know, and we have electromagnetic fields. We have, you know, some people divide our inner selves up into different types of of bodies, and somehow they're attuned to that, you know. 
it's it, I it, that was the second of those basketball sized light spheres that I'd seen. The other was in the basket the basement of an old haunted house in Michigan. No, thank and, you. <laughs> <laughs> it was seven feet away from me, hovering just below the ceiling. It, it materialized. There was supposed to have been a ghost they called Basement Billy in <laughs> Michigan. Because that sounds like something out of Ghostbusters. It does. And he lived in the basement. He he supposedly died of diphtheria when he was a teenager in that house. Oh, and people would see him out in the parking lot wearing this, these, uh, you know, late 1800s clothes. And the owner knew of that, too. Well, here's the interesting thing. We both saw Basement Billy, but all I saw was a lighted sphere. And what she saw was the full-blown figure of this young man. And, you know, we were both pretty um, shocked. It was it was quite an experience. All I wanted to do was get upstairs. Wow. Well, that's a um, clue. That's a clue to like yeah. to. That's a clue to help people clue in that uh, our, our consciousness definitely plays a part of it right. because two people that see the same, let's say, apparition or UFO or or even uh, Bigfoot or or any other type of you know um, oddity uh, d- can describe it in different ways and and can have different. Um, you know, textualizations of it, you know what I mean? So it's, that that's what's always confounding to me is like, you know, three or four or five people will see the exact, well, will basically be describing the same type of uh, uh, phenomenon account, but but the way they describe it is Whoops, different. Whoops, I lost like, you guys. Oh, oh, we can hear you. Can you hear us? No, I can't, yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, I, was, I was just saying how, uh, you know, when you have a multiple... Uh, a variety of witnesses, they can often see and describe uh, different types of things, you know? Well, she had expectation. I mean, she she had an expectation of seeing this young gentleman in, you know, dressed in clothing, and I had no expectation. Mm-hmm. And most of the time when you... I was taking photos for my, um, my Weird Michigan book, and mm-hmm. so I had lots of haunted places. I had to go and take a picture. And almost always, you go up there, you go through the motions, nothing shows up, you take a picture of nothing, and then you leave. This time, I still didn't get a picture because I was too shocked to actually even press the shutter on my camera, which I had hanging around my neck and ready to go. Um, But the thing was, she was expecting a certain thing, and I was expecting nothing. And that's whatever it was, interacted with our consciousness to show us. Yeah. Well, and it's not even, Linda, I don't even think it's limited to human consciousness either. Um, I've told this story a few times on the show, but... A couple summers ago, I woke up in the middle of the night about 4 a.m., and my dog, my English bulldog, Albie, was growling in the living room. And I came out into my living room, and while the curtains were drawn, um, there's some uh, on the ground floor window in the living room, uh, peering into my apartment uh, in the direction of my dog. I could see the silhouette of an entity that looked like a classic alien gray. And and then my other dog, who had shot out of bed once she heard him growling, she saw it too, and they were going crazy. And I, you know, I had just run out there. Uh, sort of like when you were on your walk, I had just run out there to, 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 to hush them up because it was so late. I was not expecting to see something through the, you know, peering through the yeah. curtains, uh, you know, and within 10 seconds I was, you know, I was like, oh, my God, I saw it turn its head. I could see where this long, thin neck fused at the base, at the back of, of the entity's um, skull. Uh, and I turned on my light and it was startled and it and it disappeared. It ran off. Um, and my next door neighbor actually came out onto the driveway and said that he, you know, asking me what was up. And I, and he said that he had felt like he'd been been uh, had been wa- being watched for the past hour. Uh, he was up late watching TV. Um, so th- so animals see these things, too. I mean, I-, I don't know if my dogs also saw what looked like a classic alien gray, but that was the furthest thing on <laughs> from my mind when I encountered this thing. Some, something wow. has entered the physical world. Well, and that was my and, – and, Linda, maybe you'll agree. I mean, my – I, I tend to feel like you have to trust your instincts when you're one of when you're an eyewitness. You kind of have to rely on your gut feeling about what you're seeing. And my gut instinct told me that it was something that slipped in from another realm and was passing through. And I happened to catch a glimpse of it, uh, but it was something that I wasn't supposed to to see. Yeah. Oh, well, that sounds about right. You know, it's wild. I mean, you were talking about uh, you know the expectations of what we see, and and you know. 
hearing these stories of these uh, these bipedal canines. And, and, and to be honest, you know, the legend of Dogman has really kind of come up to the surface in the, in the last decade or so. And it's very analogous to, uh, you know, to the after the Patterson Gimlin film footage, I mean, the sightings of Bigfoot kind of just skyrocketed. You know what I mean? And maybe right. it's because people's attention were more aware of it and and their expectations they had. Um, and it's also like, you know, your uncovering of the or the, the Beast of Bray Road, since I, I think that's kind of the integral one here. It seems <laughs> to be that Dogman has really resurfaced into the into the minds of the general public. And, and because of that, we are seeing and people are spotting more and more of these creatures in and around the world. Would you, would you think that kind of rings true? Yeah, I really, really do. You know, and it, I'd say it's even maybe just the last four or five years. Mm -hmm. Dog man thing has gotten kind of big for a long time. I was kind of like the lone voice in the wilderness. Right. Man, you know, and people are saying, no, there's no such thing as dog man. It's a snouted Bigfoot. Or, uh, you know, they would, it, nobody was accepting it until the critical number of witnesses just grew to such a proportion that people almost had to start paying attention. And it was allowing so many others who'd been living with these things they'd seen, you know, 20, 30, some even more than that years ago and didn't know what to do with them or where where do you file something like that in, in your mind, you know. And, and so they were coming forth. And I think and I still get there's still people you know, who are just becoming aware that it's a thing now, well, <laughs> you know, they can I, report it. I think, Linda, uh, you you uh, deserve a lot of credit for that. I mean, like I said, going into reading your books as a skeptic, you really made a believer out of me. I mean, I certainly don't know what it is exactly, uh, but um, you you bring a lot of credibility to, to these people's stories, and I'm, it's one of the one of the numerous reasons why I really appreciate and I'm a fan of your of your work. So. Yeah, hats off to you for yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Um, before we go, and we don't want to keep you too much longer. Um, uh, what when you know you were talking real? I want to circle back to something you said a few minutes ago about portals and and bodies of water because you've you've written about how. A lot of these things happen. A lot of these sightings occur not only around creeks or I think, you know, lakes, you maybe even even said. But where you have dogmen, you tend to have a uh, Bigfoot or a green mist or these orbs or UFO sightings. Uh, Skinwalker Ranch is obviously a good example of that. And sounds like Wisconsin has some crazy stuff going on <laughs> as well. Um it does. What's the relationship, um, if you could, between nature? What role does nature play in these sort of pockets of of land? Play with um, how do how do they interact with these these various types of creatures that we encounter? Well, sometimes I think it's sort of geophysical. You know, one thing Wisconsin has, which is really unusual, right, almost in the center of the state, is this miles long range. It's called the the Baraboo Range of this quartzite, it's a very ancient quartzite rock type of crystal with mm. these pink red crystal things, and that's what it's composed of. It's like this little low mountain range lying across the, the state. And right near there, you have uh, lots of concentrations of the, um, the ancient animal-shaped effigy mounds, which, by the way, 96% of ancient animal-shaped effigy mounds, that means like they're not necessarily burial, some are just ceremonial, are in southern Wisconsin. Wow. If you can imagine. And when the first settlers came, southern Wisconsin was almost like this magically transformed park where everything was mowed, these um, huge um, animal-shaped mounds, which they, they weren't real high. They were maybe three feet tall or, or not much more than that at the most, but some were like 160 feet across in the shape of there were man-shaped ones, um, the Thunderbird, various, all kinds of different animals, very stylized, but they weren't crude. They were beautifully made, and many of them persist today, the ones that weren't plowed under or whatever. We, we have parks that save some of them. But imagine all of that going on, in, and they're considered very, very sacred by almost all the tribes in the area today, although people think that it was probably ancestors of the Ho-Chunk uh, that actually constructed them. They're about 1,200 years old, most of them. And you think all of that is there. And then we also have the lake formations 
and the proximity to the Great Lakes and lots of rivers and things that go through. And the, the geology is just sort of there for that amplification of whatever, I hate to say vibes, you know, it dates mm-hmm. me. It's old mm-hmm. but, but you words sort of fail, you know, at least when you're um, a layman trying to talk about these, these concepts. Um, that could have some sort of effect on electromagnetic fields. And actually, the book I'm writing right now, I actually found somebody who, who backs that up with some studies mm-hmm. of how, an, how animals are affected by, by that sort of thing. And, and the, the electromagnetic fields, of so many things are affected by what's in the ground underneath. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to the geology of it, I believe, that most is mostly undiscovered because it's, it's just... A few laymen like me here and there going, hey, all these things are here. It must mean something. And then my hope is that the scientists will come in and say, well, let's just look at it. And maybe they will find something that, that tallies up. Maybe they won't. Maybe it will remain a mystery that we don't understand. But it is all there in in Wisconsin. Well, I just love the way you're thinking about it and really thinking in uh – for lack of a better term, uh, not only a third dim- <laughs> in third dimensions, but fourth and fifth dimensions as well. Covering your bases. Yeah, you're covering everything. <laughs> it's so cool. Um, before we let you go, I need to ask you a very uh, geeky fanboy question, if that's okay. I'm sure you get <laughs> th- you've gotten this before. But um, before you take off, can you tell us what is the weirdest thing you've ever witnessed or ever heard? Uh, from a witness that just it's one that you're like i gotta put this in the x files i don't know what to make of it well if you've read the monsters among us you've read the story about the werewolf church lady yes that's my favorite so- i'm so happy you brought that up that is my favorite weirder? story how could it get any weirder uh, and, from, and from such credible people i mean these are people that I kept going back and back to in person you know making the trip to meet up with them personally took my husband along as a truthometer and um, checked out every detail of anything they told me. And they were just ni- a nice middle-aged couple, just plain salt-of-the-earth people who were um, not wanting any attention from it. They didn't want their names used or anything like that. But they and their two children, it's four witnesses at least, plus other witnesses that I couldn't talk to, who saw this woman in a church transform almost simultaneously into a completely furry, gray wolf creature. Amazing. With Instantly, five, correct? Like she went from much. screaming to then suddenly she was just a wolf creature. Right, exactly. And they all saw it. And um, there were some elders that immediately tackled her down onto a pew because they happened <laughs> to be standing there at that time in the service. And she was kind of dragged away. And as they, all of a sudden, she was the woman again. Wow. It's that story is so it's such a great please everyone I well, implore yeah, you, you to you, read that you've wet my appetite. Well, we t- <laughs> I, I, I've read bits and pieces, but I'm holding in my hand uh, "Monsters Among Us" by Linda S. Godfrey, an exploration of otherworldly Bigfoots, Wolfmen, portals, phantoms, and odd phenomena. And if you haven't read it. Go out and get it and enjoy that crazy story because that is off the we, charts. Uh, we did an interpretation of that story uh, on, for our Patreon listeners, Linda, a couple months ago. Um, if We'll send you that file. It, uh, it was, it was really fun. To, I sort of retell the story that you tell in, in your book. And we have some fun sound effects with it, too. So Amazing. We'll, we'll send you a link to that. Um, what an honor this has been. This has been so cool, Linda. We could talk to you forever, um, and sadly, we're we just that would just be inconvenient for everyone. And but... like Dogman, <laughs> thank you for helping legitimize us. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> bringing more credibility to we, the Bigfoot we Collectors appreciate Club. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, notorious, if, if any. <laughs> uh, Linda, where can people find your work? Where can, where can they find your books? And what's the name of your upcoming book? If you have a title, that uh, when can we look forward to, to reading that? Yeah, the upcoming book is called I Know What I Saw, um, and then it's Modern Day Encounters with um, Monst- Mod- Modern Day Encounters with Monsters and Their Legends and something else. I okay, cool. Still Amazing. working on it. Awesome. <laughs> I'm in. It I'm changes in. about every week, you know, from the pu- but it is at the publisher in production now. Oh, great. And it will be out in early July. It takes them that long well, to to get the book together. But I know but, I'm going to add to my uh, July 2019 summer reading list. Totally. That's for sure. Thank you. And and your website once again is lindagodfrey.com. No great. W's, just Linda G O D F R E Y dot com, and it's got 
pretty much everything. Just navigate your way around. There's a search bar and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's a great website. I've uh, I've spent uh, many many a time there. So mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I really am such a and and I think I speak for the guys as well. We're big fans of yours, Linda. Please keep up the good work and uh, yep. please come back on the show sometime. We would love to talk to you again. Maybe when your new book comes out. A most welcomed guest. Yes. Thank you so much. I would love that. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Linda. We will talk to you again in the future. Okay. And awesome. you and your listeners have a wonderful day. Oh, thank you. Thanks, we will. Linda. Oh, you're the best. <laughs> I hope you had fun. I did. I okay, did. Cool. I still have. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, this is going to go up next week. And when it does, I will, I will uh, send you uh, a link so you can listen to it. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Man, you're the best, Linda. Thank you so, so much. And I know, right? I really <laughs> wish you could see Bryce's smile right now. Yeah. It's been such an awesome I'm conversation. Too. I'm satiated. Good. Yay. Cryptedly satiated. All right. You're in the Hall of Fame. You're. Uh, we're going to bug you to come back on the show sometime for sure. Okay. I'm going to hold you to that. Okay. Great. Have All a great right. time. Uh, have a great night. And we'll we'll talk to you again. Bye. Okay. So great. Bye. Bye bye. And we're back, and it's time for High Strangeness. But first, how great was that interview with Linda? Phenomenal. Gosh. Mm-hmm. Hey, maybe that's where that word comes. Phenomena, phenomenal. I think it is. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Yeah. It was interview. a phenomenal, phenomenon that's interview. Just, everybody knows that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I've got a uh, another story that I think is pretty phenomenal in and of itself. Um, this is my story of High Strangeness this week. And um, this is called... Let's call this the Reed Family Off-World Experiences. Are you familiar with Thomas Reed and his case of abduction? This is sounding familiar, but mm-hmm. it's not jumping off uh, off the top of my head, no. If, if it sounds familiar, it's probably because... Um, it happened this... to me? <laughs> you are Thomas Reed. You might want to... No. You get regressed. Um... Go, gotta get regressed, <laughs> You gotta get regressed. You gotta get regressed. gotta get regressed. It might sound familiar because... The Great Barrington Historical Society and Museum has formally inducted the UFO story as part of their as a historical site where the where the actual uh, abduction took place, and this is the first story um, having to do with UFOs or anything like that that made it into a uh, into a city's historical site. What is the Great Barrington? Is that the name of the town? This is the name of the town. Yes, nearby. What's a Great Barrington? Um, but they are. Um, so this is how the story goes. In 1966, a six-year-old Thomas Reed and his younger brother, um, Matthew Reed, um, were in his bedroom on his family's horse farm in the Berkshires when this first encounter begins. Basically, they were in their bedroom when Thomas says, you know, they're just kind of fooling around. They're on a, they're on a bunk bed and, you know, they're just talking to each other. And, and, uh, and this kind of orb... Suddenly, you know, they felt the kind of temperature and the barometric pe- pressure kind of just drop. You know, everything kind of got really still. And uh, this light that they kind of noticed outside made its way in the shape or form of an orb into their bedroom. It's just what Linda was talking about. Yeah, it was. And uh, so they're kind of staring at this thing. And uh, when, when the light from outside started to get really, really bright... And basically, the next thing they remember is, boom, they're outside on their farm staring at a UFO. Um, Yeah, and from that point, they were, um, you know, the UFO kind of moves off. What kind of craft? uh, Disc-shaped. I think he he originally described it as almost like a hula hoop, like this bright blue and white lighted hula hoop. Um, So... You know, disc shaped, uh, cigar shaped, depending on your angle of it. Was it a ring? Yeah, it yeah, hollow in the middle? yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I suppose so. I mean, there's not too much more detail on that, but so a circle. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, their mother brings them back into the house, and um, and that was the first incident that took place in 1966 in September. The following year, there's another incident at their home on Boardman Street in Sheffield. More strange lights the sound of doors slamming and then the boys are back inside the vessel this is this second encounter is where it gets really creepy because so it's about a year later from that first encounter and they're both kind of like 
all they remember is just boom that light was in their room and then they're outside looking at this thing and they have a memory of looking at the UFO yes a conscious all year memory long, they yeah think about it. yeah okay. that's right a conscious memory of looking at this thing so a year later again in September um, you know again they're in their bedroom it's nighttime and the mom had come in um, I believe her name is Nancy um, her mom came in and thought there was a storm coming so she shut the door window and she's like oh I, lightning that's strange no thunder but you know she shut the window and so she goes back to bed and um, and the boys kind of see this this kind of light growing from outside and uh, to where all of a sudden you know it's literally like engulfed their room Matthew the younger brother who's now five looks over at to where Thomas was and he's he's gone he's not there and so Matthew the younger brother runs to go get his mom and their grandmother lived with them too um, you know so it was the grandma mom and the two boys now Matthew runs down the hall to go get his mom and he remembers her almost like in this kind of catatonic couldn't move state um, he describes it as like her hands and her feet could move and was kind of crunching the blanket and crunching the blankets but she Terrifying. yeah I mean and this is a five-year-old kid you know and um, but she couldn't move um, finally he's able she, he's able to kind of get her up you know after a while and uh, and they and they get up and they're going down you know he's screaming he's like you know come into the bedroom come into the bedroom and, <clears throat> and then you know they he says that they hear this sound of door slamming you know it was an actual door slamming and this high-pitched kind of screeching you know and then as the mom and the Matthew were walking down the hall Matthew's gone literally disappears from you know basically right in front of her um, so she went from being catatonic to being able to get up and yeah. walk down the hall with him? Yeah, I think that's how it plays out because I know that they walked back down the hall into their bedroom and that's when she was uh, literally walking with him and then Matthew literally disappeared from her view. Um, now, she, uh, the next thing Thomas knows... Uh, oh, and then it's, you know, the, so the boys are back inside this, this vessel... Um, you know, this inside this UFO craft. And I'll get back to more on that later. Now, the next thing Thomas Reed knows is that he's in his driveway being scooped up by his mother, who has been searchingly, frantically for the boys on horseback. So, you know, as her boys are gone, she literally is like looking all over for these, you know, she saddles up her horse and literally starts, you know, combing the property for them, thinking that they had, you know, God knows what. Um, come to find out, that uh, maybe she did know what happened to them because this isn't the first uh, UFO experience that she had. In 1954, I believe was the year, and when she was in Maine with a friend, her and her friend spotted um, a UFO literally right overhead of them. And uh, so she had a history, you know, um, before her boys were even born, you know, of seeing a large lighted craft uh, with, with somebody next to her. Now, those are the first two incidences of the boys, Thomas and Matthew. Two years later, the family is driving on Route 7, and they're coming back from a horse show, because um, they had raised horses, and they're basically going through this, uh, what's called Sheffield Bridge. You ever seen Bridges of Madison County? You know those kind of really quaint little I've bridges? I've seen it. Mm -hmm. 300 times? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, imagine this little bridge. It's a, like a little carport bridge that, uh, that goes kind of over... Kind of those a, little barn-looking yeah, bridges. Yeah, that's exactly right. Bridge. That just goes over a small creek. Now, <clears throat> as they're going into this bridge, you know, the grandma who's in the passenger seat, the mom is driving, um, you know, the grandma turns around because Thomas had given his younger brother Matthew a fireball and she was going to say, you know, don't be careful, he could choke. And when she sees this kind of large kind of lighted area through the woods which she described later as like a lighted strip mall so as wow. they're going through the bridge you know Thomas Reed remembers these lights kind of engulfing the the bridge coming through the cracks underneath the floor and as they exit the uh, uh, this bridge it's a small bridge only about like 30 feet and they get out, <clears throat> and the car suddenly stalls. It just pulls over on the side of the road. And 
And what he says is like the barometric pressure drops again, so much so that it gets so silent that the sounds of cricket and cicadas, I, is that cicadas, how you, cicadas um, just became um, voluminous in volume. Like it was almost like, you know, um, That's super loud, super loud, but also at the same time, super quiet. And, uh, and then, so basically the light is, as they, as they exit the bridge, now let me get back real a couple seconds here. Before they stall, they both look over, they get past the bridge, they look over and they see this kind of like spherical craft, um, almost like with lights coming out from underneath it, almost like in the shape of a, of an ice cream cone, you know, um, and they're driving and it's following along parallel with them. You know, and this is this is kind of around dusk, around nighttime, when all of a sudden this this spherical lighted object veers right in front of their car, and that's when the thing stalled out. And you know, <clears throat> now the next thing that these this whole family remembers is boom. Well, Thomas Reed has a conscious memory of after that. Um, next thing he knows, he's in this large hangar. He describes it as this, like, you know, large kind of metallic hanger, just huge. And he could hear the muffled sounds of his of his mom and his grandma, you know, kind of screaming for him, which is, you know, just awful if you think about it. Um, I'd rather not. I know, <laughs> I know. So, but then the next thing that happened uh, is he remembers being kind of grabbed by his left arm and taken to this, you know, to this kind of what this room where he was laid on a table which we hear so so many times before and kind of he was put in this cage as he described it like like they kind of like covered his body and um and these these weird this weird kind of creature that he described that sort of looked like an ant it had like a football shaped head teardrop bamboo stick type legs oh <clears throat> what what we might describe as like the a praying mantis style. yeah i was gonna say this sounds like one of the uh mant mantisoid mm-hmm. aliens yeah but he, he he described it in a way that was almost like it was genetically modified like it was almost like ai type but with with some human characteristics because it had human hands um strange and uh and so it places these like weird like rocks on his body that he described looking like raisins you know it almost makes you think of what's that stone that therapy where they put the hot stones well right. hot stone therapy yeah um something like that hot rocks hot rocks yeah exactly <laughs> um i don't know what the purpose of that was i think it's called pop rocks pop therapy. rock therapy <laughs> yeah exactly um but then the next thing he knows and it goes into more detail when he when, when he talks about it uh hearing a couple of, of the interviews that he did the next thing he knows is they're back on the street. His mom, it, the car is facing the opposite way. His mom is in the driver's seat. His grandma is in the middle of the road, kind of wandering aimlessly around. And his younger brother is is kind of out cold in the back seat in a fetal position. And uh, and so they were all, you know, just kind of plopped back into um, their car. Their car. Um, now, Reed has told these stories many times, and it hasn't always gone well, but recently his tale had found recognition in an unlikely place. The Great Barrington Historical Society and Museum has formally inducted the UFO story. What does that mean? It means we believe that it's true, said Debbie Oberman, the director of the society. I know we're going to get a lot of backlash, we're going to get hammered, she said, but we have given it an awful lot of thought, and based on the evidence we've been given... We believe this is a significant and true event. The Historical Society believes it's the first time a mainstream historical society or museum in the United States has declared a UFO encounter to be historical fact. Uh, But the decision was far from unanimous. You know, there were nine board members on the society. Three of them were strongly opposed, Uh, but it passed with consensus. Um, That's awesome. Good on them. Yeah. What most interested the Historical Society is the 1969 encounter when all four of them were on the road because dozens of people in the area reported seeing an unidentified flying object around that time, typically described as a disc-shaped craft performing acrobatic maneuvers in the sky. 
Many of those eyewitnesses called the local radio station, WSBS, which covered the sightings in real time. Um, the radio station provided documentation to the Historical Society, which interviewed uh, many of the eyewitnesses, and they also examined a polygraph test taken by Thomas Reed. Um, the Reed abductions are well known in the world of UFO enthusiasts. Um, now, it gets interesting, too, because in March of 2009, his brother Matthew, who is now a, um, uh, he's an officer of the law and uh, a private, inve- he's an investigator. He's Judge Dredd. Yeah, well, basically. He is the law. <clears throat> yeah, he's a, he's a plainclothes officer, and he was driving back from, uh, I believe it was Brownsburg, Indiana, from a movie. And uh, as he's driving home, he drops his friend off, and he's driving, and he sees this this kind of orange ball of light in the sky. And, uh, and he starts to kind of follow it, you know, and he's driving down this road, and he sees it, he see it, he sees it goes behind this house, and, uh, and he follows it. I don't know why he would, but, you know, sometimes people are just led to these things. And, uh, and as he's following it, boom, the next thing he remembers is he's in an open field and there's a little bit of blood under his nose. There's mud on his shoes and, uh, and his watch is, you know, off by about an hour and a half. Whoa. Finally, you know, he makes his way back to his car and, uh, which, which he turns it on and the gauges go, they go bad shit. You know, they're, they're flipping around and then they're dialing around <clears throat> And so he makes his way back home. And, you know, I think he had kind of repressed a lot of those memories when he was younger. Um, and so he starts to get a really uneasy feeling, and he decides to contact MUFON that night, um, which is the Mu- uh, Mutual, the Mutual UFO, UFO Network. Network. Um, and they, and they, they hear his tale, and they bring out a, um, a licensed investigator, uh, Steve White, I believe is his name. That, yes, a detective with 30 years of experience. Um, he investigates the case for MUFON. And once he gets there, you know, he starts hearing Matthew's story. And, uh, and he starts asking about if there's anything else like this happened. And it kind of, you know, opened up that tale of when they were younger boys. And so he calls his younger brother, his older brother, Thomas, who comes over And then they start to divulge to Steve White, you know, the family's history with abductions. And that's when he brings in more of his own investigators and they take a look, you know, and he starts to really like investigate this case. He's like, there's a lot here. Um, Not to mention, you know, that 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 case in 1969 got it got a a, a J. Allen Hynek and valet classification a legitimate classification as a CE4 incident, a close encounters of the fourth, fourth kind incident, um, you know, which was, which was kind of a big deal. It legitimized, um, you know, their story of, of what took place early on in their two lives. Cause they took a lot of shit for it. You know, sure. uh, they owned a restaurant called the village green in Sheffield. And, uh, and, you know, it, it really kind of tore their family apart. Those first two incidences where the boys were taken anyway, back to Matthew in the year 2009, so Steve White brings out these investigators and, uh, and they start to go over the car. He says, I, you know, we just need some evidence. And, you know, he turns on the car and the, the dials go crazy. And so they bring out their electromagnometer and they find that it's kind of off the charts, uh, with, with, uh, with radiation. One Thanks. of the, one of the detectives says, uh, uh I, I forget how it was quoted. He's like, uh, this is like readings from a sun, <laughs> you Whoa. know, Whoa. um, especially towards the back of the car. Um, so there was, uh, there was that, which really made him think there was something here. Um, anyway, so... And, and was that before or after it was put into the uh, historical society? This was after, I believe. Wow. Oh, wait, no, no, this was before. Leading His up ca- to yeah, that. The, uh, they, they put it in the historical society in 2015. But oh, they... Okay. But in that consensus on that board of nine members, they make no mention of the first two abductions, and they make no mention of the 2009 case. Um, Which abduction do they... Just the bridge? They focus on the one by the bridge, bridge, yeah. Now, there's so many interesting elements to this story, too. Um, 
you know, Robert Bigelow pops back up in this one as he sent part of his own private team of investigators from Bass, Bigelow Advanced Aerospace Space Studies, uh, to go meet with the Reeds before the MUFON investigators get there, I think is how it goes. But either way, regardless, we know that uh, Bigelow and his team, uh, his new team, not NIDS, which right. we've covered before, uh, was very interested in this case with the Reed family. Wow. Um, and where are they today? Today, oh, uh, so very interesting. You know, Thomas Reed, uh, I believe he's in Knoxville, Tennessee. But you know, he he hit part his life. He moved to Miami and created uh, Miami Models. He became you know, um, he became a big model agency runner and, and stuff so like that. So he became a scumbag, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, but anyway, I mean, I, I I feel like I you know brushed through so many of the details of this story, but. But there's so much more to this. Uh, even even their father, who uh, I was going to say, where's dad in all this? Because I feel like I could blame this whole thing on an absentee father. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, their father was uh, was reported as is kind of uh, missing from their lives and an alcoholic, I believe. And you know, his mother his mother actually re- ended up um, remarrying a guy named uh, I forget his name. But uh, he went on to run for um, a state legislature and actually got the job. So he was very kind of hush hush about like this family bringing up these incidences. But yeah, no. So that's the story of the the Reed family off world experiences. And he, you know, he was very he never liked calling them an abduction. He always right. he always wanted it to call it an off world experience. Whoa. Um, yeah, and and his brother describes being in the ship too. Once he started to regain a memory of it, and he described like three. You know, type gray type entities, the typical gray with like he called it like el- they had like elephant skin and weird and um and yeah, but uh, so uh so do we know since two thousand nine if they've had any type of other encounters? Do they have kids? Yeah, that's a great question. So Thomas Reed's son um, was reported to have like some real like adept uh, abilities. You know, um, so much so that... um, Like he's telekinetic? uh, Yeah, this says uh, Knoxville Hypnosis Center um, sent him a letter from Michael Buckner, PhD, of the director of Knoxville Hypnosis Center, said, this is to confirm that I interviewed your son earlier this year, and he is an intelligent, capable young man who appears to have some intuitive or psychic ability. In my interview with him, he was consistently able to tell me numbers that I wrote down on a piece of paper oh. that he could not see. You also mentioned that he seems to be able to do remote viewing, which I was able to confirm. It was a pleasure to interview your son and to work with you. So uh, this we seems... need eyes on that kid. <laughs> I know. Seriously, is he, in a, is he like our age now? He's uh, got to be pretty old yeah, I think now. He's in his teens or something like that. But, We're... Uh... Yeah, our age. Yeah, yeah. our age. Yeah, so basically our age. But no, that's an interesting question that you asked because yes, they do believe that this is uh, that this remains within their family and that this is generational and that uh, yeah. So seems like it. There's there's some connection in this family there's here. Definitely some type wow. of connection that uh, whoever's you know taking them or or you know offering them these experiences have a have a direct interest in that family genetic line wow i had not heard the story before i'll have to dig in and do a little bit more research but sounds like your classic off-world experience yeah yes yeah absolutely it's all there it would make a great film. It's so the way you told it to, so cinematic. Like I could see that bridge and that hangar and everything. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's yeah. super scary. This one's scary. Yeah, there's some yeah. dark notes to it as well. Um, you know, there was a this this his father uh, who ended up marrying his mother um, um, later in their life. He ended up not wanting to talk about these incidences with the UFOs. But once his political career kind of ended. Um, you know, he befriended a lawyer uh, named uh, Buckman or something like that who took this case to the U.N. So this case was heard at the United Nations on October 2nd, I believe. Um, uh, what was the date? Uh, but anyway, and then that the, the same the same day it was uh, that, that, that his lawyer, his father's lawyer, presented it to the case. His father kind of died around some mysterious circumstances. What? Yeah, it was... Uh, he died of uh, oh god now this is where I wish I had my notes but uh, 
some sort of uh, legionnaire's disease or something like that. And they mm. com- they combed his office and they found like f- new ceiling tiles. And in the vent, they found like this empty vial. What? Yeah. So it's like there's some foul play um, type things happening in this one. Some conspiracy theories. Uh, oh, here we go. This one. Yeah, here we go. Uh, in 2006, Howard was the guy's name, voiced his interest in a collective book project on the family's experiences with vessels and other life forms to include a compilation of sensitive material gathered over the years. Howard suffered an untimely death by a virus of unknown origin on October 2nd. This was 14 years to the day after the Reed's case was mentioned at the United Nations Symposium, October 2nd, 1992. The CDC, on sweeping Howard's office, reported finding a vial containing the deadly virus in his air conditioning unit. The Wait, build- the CDC? The con- yeah, the Center for Disease Control. Whoa. The building was closed and remains closed to this day. On October 6th was then proclaimed a day of remembrance in Howard's honor. What year? What year? This was uh, 1992 uh, by the city of Bridgeport, Connecticut, as he was strongly supported by Senator Christopher Dodd, a Ph.D. who released his test results regarding the Reed case after evaluating family members. On September 15th, 2010, was also found dead on November 12th, 2010, just eight weeks later. Um that's scary. Yeah, I mean, That's yeah, wild. Isn't that wild? Yeah, I mean, the 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 CDC saying they found the vial too. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's very legitimate. That's not like some fringe organization. That's, no, I mean, no, I know. So, I mean, it le- leaves you wondering a few things anyway. But uh, so this is the this is the kind of case of the uh, the Reed family that's been torn apart by this uh, these happenings. Um, yeah, that is a fascinating. Wow, story. that was just a couple years after that um, when he died. Well, it's weird. It's just a couple of years after the Linda Napolitano UFO abduction case in Manhattan that also involved like a UN witness. I don't mm. know. It's kind of weird. Yeah, that's right. That, that that's related. Be, I think. I mean, because they were speaking, they were gonna. Um, that guy was gonna be speaking at that symposium um, at the United Nations, which was to uh, I forget what the the details surrounding why they were holding that symposium. I I, I could do a little bit more research, but yeah, that's a very interesting case. That one's called the Brooklyn Bridge Abduction. Yeah, we'll have um, to cover that at some point. Bud Hopkins wrote a book on. Creepy, creepy, creepy. Yeah, that's another creepy one. Oh, well, there you go. There's your story of high strangeness. Loved it. Great job, man. That's spooky. I'm going to think about that uh, that mini mall flying out of the woods. Yeah, (laughs) wild. (laughs) Through the bridge slides. <clears throat> um, well, all right, guys. Before we go, anything? Uh, great job, Bryce. Thank, thank you, you for that. Uh, anything to plug? No, uh, you know I, they, we do have some a new special thing here on the BCC. Oh, that that's I think right. We Why don't you plug. tell the kids? Well, we've set up a paranormal hotline for you guys. So oh yeah, we love your emails, and we've been getting a lot of them lately. So thank you guys for sending those. Keep them coming. We've got more L files coming. Bigfootcollectorsclub at gmail dot com. That's right. But the new thing that we have is we have a phone number now where you can call us and we might not, we might pick up. We're we pro- not going to pick up. We probably won't. But leave us a message. I'll pick up. <laughs> Bryce will be there. <laughs> but we it, it goes directly to his Bigfoot Museum office. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> if anyone when he's on set break from uh, BJ and the Shadow Bats, he'll be sitting back there yeah. answering your calls. <laughs> All right, guys. So here's the hotline number where you can call and leave your message and hear it possibly played back on the show. The number for Bigfoot Collectors Club is 310-597-4803. Now, can people call from their cell phones? You can call from a cell phone. You can call from a Skype. You can call from a landline. You can call from a time machine. You can call anywhere. Definitely, if you are in a time machine, call us from a time machine. Please do that. And we want to hear your stories. Uh, now, you can leave those. Keep you know, Try to keep it around two, three minutes long because uh, the shorter, the more, the tighter it is, the more likely we'll be able to play it on the show. Very true. So, um, so can you give that number again there? It's 310-597-4803. This reminds me so much of the uh, of that Ghostbusters commercial, totally. which was one of my favorite thing about Ghostbusters. Um, I should play that for you now here. It was like, have you seen a spook, specter, or a ghost? Yeah. Um, we um, want to hear right. about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> If the answer is yes, then don't wait another minute. Pick up your phone and call the professionals. Go Ghostbusters. Bigfoot Collectors Club. <laughs> staff is on call 24 hours a day to serve all your supernatural elimination needs. We're ready to believe you. Perfect. That's Perfect. us. Perfect.
Um, so call that number, leave some messages. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I wanted to remind everybody that uh, my comic book Venture Van is out there in comic shops. You can order uh, issue three still. Pre-order it. It'll be out, uh, I believe, on uh, either the 24th or the 31st of this month. Um, also, uh, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is coming back this week as you listen to this uh, Friday, October 12th. And uh, I'm not in the first episode, but I'll be in it shortly. So enjoy that. And uh, until then, we remain Bigfoot Collectors Club. I want to thank uh, Linda S. Godfrey one last time for being an amazing guest. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I wish we could have heard her opinions on that um, High Strangeness story. We'll have to but bring her back. We'll have to bring her back <laughs> and talk more about all this stuff. I'm looking forward to that new book. Um, definitely go out and check out her work. It is, it's some of the best written uh, cryptid investigation um, material I've ever read. So it's really fun, too. Awesome. Agreed. Check that stuff out. All right, guys. All right. We'll see you see next, you next week. week. You need to get regressed. (laughs) Get regressed. Bigfoot Collectors Club is produced by Riley Bray. Our theme song is Come Alone by Sun Eaters, courtesy of Lotus Pool Records. If you like the show, please rate and review us on iTunes. It really helps get the podcast to more listeners. To support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Bigfoot Collectors Club and unlock multiple reward episodes every month.